Guys, work hard when you're young. He built his first company over nine years, sold it for 425 million bucks. It's called LinkShare. Very nice, obviously, business model there. And two years later, went into a new business called CollectiveEye.com. Uh, think of it, you know, he's building neural nets, really trying to help CROs at companies understand what their actual pipeline looks like based off a contributor model. There's a free tool they use to get this data. They've got 101 folks on the team today. They've quote unquote bootstrapped it, but put in a lot of their own money to fund it up to date as they look to continue to scale. Got their first paying customer in 2012, broke a million dollar run rate in 2014. Hey, folks, my guest today is Steven Messer. He uh, currently serves as co founder and vice chairman of Collective Eye. Prior to Collective Eye, he co founded and served as CEO of LinkShare until its sale to Rakuten for 425 million bucks. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Lafayette University and his Juris Doctorate from Cord uh, Cardozo School uh, of Law. All right, Steven, you ready to take us to the top? I'm going to do our best. All right. What was it like? Just I guess before we talk about collective, what was it like at recruiting? I mean, were you sort of joining it as already the Titanic? You just had to drive the right way, or were you still in building mode? No. So when LinkShare got acquired, I mean, we had been doing it for about ten years. So affiliate marketing became a thing under LinkShare. We were the first affiliate marketer. We became the global player. I think when we when we finally sold the business to Rakuten, it was probably ninety six percent of the affiliate market globally. And still is today. It's just behind the scenes that most people don't know. So when we came there, it was the first American acquisition they had made. And I think to this day, it's probably still the greatest revenue producer outside of Japan hmm. um, that Rakuten has ever had. Interesting. So I mean, everyone's going to want to know a $425 million acquisition price, you were CEO. I mean, do you get filthy rich on this or how did that work out? <laughs> well, filthy rich is always in anyone's eyes, right? Uh, it's what it depends what you want. Look, we were fortunate in the sense that we didn't come from a lot of means. Uh, but we had worked really hard. We had built the business. It had become quite successful. It had grown really quickly. More importantly, it had enabled every other entrepreneur to make a living off their business in a way they couldn't have done today. So when you look at the creator economy, when you look at people who had blogs, uh, podcasts, well, all of them were making commissions on sales from referring people to other websites. And that was really what LinkShare enabled. And and for us, it was just a joy to be there. So uh, while I think we did very well, and I'm very happy with how we performed um, and the results we got, what I'm most happy is every month we were sending out millions of dollars worth of checks to people um, and changing their lives. And, and so I hope uh, that business continues to change lives of all the great entrepreneurs that are out there probably listening to this amazing podcast. I love that. Yeah, you found it in 1996, sold on 2005, so it's a while ago now. Do you ever look back and go, oh, gosh, we could have taken that to like 10 billion or no, it was the right time. 425 was the right number. You know, I don't think you ever look back as a founder. You know this, right? Nathan, you speak to great people all the time. You've built great things. Um, what you know more than anything else is that there's always another thing to build and always another opportunity to scale. And uh, and I'm I'm really proud that LinkShare to this day is still a dominant provider in space. I'm happy that Collective Eye is a dominant provider in its space as well. And uh, I'm happy to be associated with a whole bunch of other companies, uh, whether it be on their boards or helping them get started. Uh, and I don't I don't think that'll ever stop. All right, let's talk about Collective Eye. You launched it, I think, in 2008. Walk us through who who's who's paying for this and what are you giving them? I mean, look, the benefit of having uh, the, the the exit that we had and a whole bunch of others is that it enabled us to fund something that probably people wouldn't have done. Um, you know, we are a neural net based technology. So for anyone who's used chat GPT recently or stable diffusion, you're starting it for the first time as an individual feel the power of this neural net AI that people like us have been talking about, but you had to be a real practitioner in this stuff. And, um, and we, we just had a great opportunity to be on that forefront of that group that today is, you know, OpenAI is not a young company. It's been around for almost a decade as well. We have all started at the same time. We're all getting to this inflection point where these technologies are just dominating the way we think about how the future of work will be. Oh, what's going on there, YouTube? Good to see you guys. Now imagine this. You love watching these interviews with SaaS founders, but imagine if we took all of the valuation data out from over 2,807 interviews I've done manually. Saves you a lot of time. Well, we've done this. We've built it into the beautiful interface inside of FounderPath. Check this out. I'll show you how you can access this in a second, but you log in, you connect your Stripe account, you see your valuation in real time, you can see what it changed over the past 88 days, and even set goals for valuation this year. 
Now, the secret to valuation is there's many different ways to value a SaaS business. So the reason you're going to see three or four different valuations inside of your founder path dashboard, this is all free, by the way, is because depending on who's doing the buying of your SaaS company, you're going to get a different valuation. A VC is going to pay a different valuation. Private equity firm is different. If you're going to do a minority sale, that's different. And if you sell the whole business, that's a different valuation. You can see all those when I hover over here. All right, so the teal is what a VC would pay. Yellow is what private equity. And red is if you sold the whole thing outright. Now, what's cool about this is this is not built off random data. Again, you guys hear these interviews on YouTube. All these data are built from real-time valuation data points founders share with us on the show. So traction, 1.2 million. Seed round, 3.7 raise. They sold 22% of their business. Go in here and filter by the event. Maybe you only want to see companies that have sold the whole business. Well, here are a bunch that have been acquired, the valuation and the multiple. Maybe you're going out right now and you're raising your seed round. Well, go in here and look at all this recent seed deals that went down, what they raised, what valuation they raised at, and what percent that they sold. There's never been a larger data set of SaaS valuations than what you can get now inside of FounderPath, and we're thrilled to bring it to you. All right, we're gonna go back to the YouTube video here in a second, but if you wanna check this tool out, if you wanna jump in and sign up, you can check it out for free to get your valuation at this link, this link, founderpath.com forward slash products forward slash valuations. Or if you go to founderpath.com and hover over products, click on get your valuation here, and go ahead and sign up to give it a whirl. Again, all that valuation data live right inside the platform. I hope to see you there. All right, let's jump back into the interview. So who, who is buying Collective AI today? What's your main customer segment? Yeah, so we sell predominantly to, to sales organizations. So when you're thinking about it, if you, if you run a sales org, you probably have no idea what they're working on. You have probably no idea what revenue they're gonna bring in. You're trying to figure out what's changing in the market because it's always changing. And you're trying to figure out how to manage more effectively. Well, that is essentially what we saw. We removed the need to log anything for those people who are suffering in CRM every day. Imagine a world where the AI did the work of logging all the people you spoke to, the conversations you had, the communications that went back and forth. Imagine if it did that automatically. Then imagine if it told you which deals were real. And the reason it did that was because just like Waze, it's observing other sellers in our network and seeing how the buyer is behaving when they buy, when they don't buy down to the individual. So it's telling you every day, if this is a deal you should actually pursue. And you may not know this in sales, they had this saying, buyers lie, because you never really know if they're interested or not. Well, imagine if the AI could tell you, no, no, they are really interested. Or I mean, are you buying or sitting on the same intent data that Bombora and some of these other providers are sitting on? Or do you have a unique data set? It's a unique data set. So if you think about it in sales, my experience when I close a deal is mine. I, you can only find out about it if you hire me to work on them again. But in our model, we're observing every transaction of every customer, just like Waze observing your journey. Without How do you get ever access to that data? Any confidential. Well, they're giving us access to their CRM through the API, email, oh, calendar, phone, video conference. So just behind the scenes, we're logging all that activity. We're also observing what's actually taking place. And in a confidential way, it's all, all abstracted away. Like no one knows that you've left your home, but they know the fastest route because when you've been driving, it's guiding ways to learn about that journey that they can share with the next person who's behind them to find the so, fastest route. So Stephen, let We're me give an example thing. here. ClickUp, ClickUp's CRO might pay for your software so that they can get an understanding of their top 10 deals. They think they're going to close in Q1, but oh crap, they just saw that one of those deals purchased Basecamp, a competitor. They're now not a deal. How, how, do, how do you give them the information that the ClickUp prospect just bought a competitor? Do you get receipt data from that person's inbox or how does that work? So the way we deal with it is we're actually, uh, it's a better way of thinking about it is by observing sellers across multiple buyers, I can spot when that particular buyer is behaving like they're going to buy or not. Because for all the AI knows, they may buy both, right? I don't think they're going to, but let's say they make a mistake and they buy the wrong product, right? The odds are going to start changing as the buyer's behavior starts changing, as they don't bring in the right people, as they start communicating different things, or they say things like, oh, that's really interesting. Can you send me this piece of information? But that always means they're not interested in buying. The thing is, you just don't know it because for you, it's your first experience with this buyer. But when an AI is observing multiple people selling that same person, it can spot it cold. Oh, and I see. And it starts guiding you and figuring it out. So, so you're, you're not looking you in the odds. inbox. You're not looking in the inbox of the ClickUp 
prospect, ClickUp is giving you access to their sales team's inbox. And you're looking at like response times or length of the email or the questions asked by the potential buyer in the ClickUp head of sales email inbox. Down to that individual. We're, we're talking about almost close to a million different data features. So that's a lot of data that we're able to observe that say, okay, this person is likely to buy or I not see. likely to buy. And it helps I us see. really understand it. And today we track about 5% of the globe's B2B economy. So we see a lot of that data and we see that interaction. So we can tell you, here's what's happening. So how many, companies like other cool ClickUp, how many companies like ClickUp have Collective AI basically installed? They're using you. It's everyone from Fortune 5 companies down to SMB. It doesn't But how many? Uh, we don't disclose the actual number. We usually just disclose about 5%. Of the globe's B2B economy is passing through us every day. Well, I have no, we have just, no idea what that number is. So we don't know what 5% means. Well, I'll, let me put it in perspective. Uh, Amazon is the equivalent of 5% of B2C. So it's the Amazon of B2B data. It's a lot of transactional data. Billions of dollars are passing through us. That we're just observing how people are buying and selling and getting their deals done. Do people have to go to Collective AI and sign up? Like, is there a way for you to get access to inboxes like ClickUp sales team without ClickUp CRO signing up for Collective Eye? Yeah, you can go to intelligence.com and get the free version. And for sales professionals or any individual contributor, they'll always be able to get access to the product for free forever, which includes free contacts. That you don't have to pay for if you're going to Zoom or Seamless or those other players. You get free contacts forever. You get free relationship mapping, free activity capture, free deep collaboration daily forecasting and daily odds on your deals, you will get that free forever just by going in and signing up and connecting two APIs, email calendar and CRM to start. Okay. If a company so wants it, say, they pay. They always say if it's free, you're the product. So that they people sort of understand that's what's happening here. You're using collective intelligence, which is great. Um, I guess walk me through the backstory here. So, so how many folks are on the team full-time today? About 140 in the company. Okay, 140. How many are engineers? Um, almost the entire company's engineering. Well, who does marketing, sales, product, CFO? Very small team. And the product spreads itself very quickly. It's very viral for sales organizations. Uh, when you join, uh, the first thing you do is you have the ability to automatically add anybody who's helping work with you on a deal. So the first thing is, let's say I'm a sales professional and I'm working with three other people, a sales engineer, a finance person, a legal person. It will automatically invite them to join for free. That brings them in where they can actually work collaboratively on a single deal. There's no cost for that. That helps it grow. When you mm -hmm. have connectors, which is a product that helps you find which friends of yours actually know the buyers that you're trying to reach and how well do they know them? Well, that you just click for free. They can invite and join people. That's predominantly how we scale. But Stephen, like Gabriel Koning on LinkedIn is listed as one of your content writing folks on your marketing team. Right? How many people are non-engineers like Gabriella? Maybe 15, 20. 20 folks. Okay. Not a large, not a large group. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So about 120 engineers. Uh obviously that's expensive. Are these all in the US? Engineers in the US? Mostly in the US, a few are around the world. Uh, again, deep learning is not a simple piece of technology to build, manage, and scale. They call it the game of kings for a reason. Yeah. And is this all freemium right now, or do you have folks that pay? And if they're paying, what do they pay for? So the people who pay in our products, so if you think of our model. It's not a SaaS model. It's a, what's, what's called the data network or community model. So if you're familiar with Waze, you know that as a consumer, I'm sorry, as a contributor of data, by using the product, you get the product for free. That's the individual yep. contributor. When you're a consumer of the data, in the B2C world, that's usually advertisers. So that would be like Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks paying for an ad. They're the, they're the person who pays. In our world, it's B2B. So it's really leaders and managers of a sales organization who want to get visibility into daily forecasting, know which deals are real, which ones aren't, to be able to do deal inspection, to understand what's going on. For those people, they're going to buy the product on a per seat basis Okay. while their team gets it for free. I see. Okay. That makes sense. And and give me a sort of range here. Are we talking like $10,000 a month contracts, $100,000 a year contract? What's sort of the range of ACVs you're looking at? Usually you're looking at per, per manager, roughly around $9,000 a year per manager. So okay. depending on how big your team is. So our ACV is usually above $100,000, but we have SMBs all the way up. Got it. And someone paying you 100000 bucks a year, that would be like what? Like a team of seven or eight, something like that? 
Yeah, exactly. And then you're talking about also their sales organization. They might use us for another product we offer called Intelligent Writeback. For those of you who have CRM, we're trying to give your CRM hygiene. If you want all the activity data and contact data that we capture, push back into your CRM. That's another product we offer called Intelligent Writeback. Okay. Now you, I don't think, I don't think you've bootstrapped. I think you've raised a bunch. Walk me through your funding history and why you decided to raise. No, we actually bootstrapped the whole thing. The business has been funded by us. Um, and oh, you uh, were the twenty million that. Series A. Uh, there, there is no twenty million dollars Series A. It's actually uh, much more money than that into this company. Um, AI companies, you're usually talking about, you know, no, usually north of a hundred million dollars to get these companies off the ground. Why do I and see do a that Series A? Why do I see a Series A twenty million dollar deal on your profile on Crunchbase? Not accurate. We have no idea how that got there or who even put <laughs> that in there. <laughs> People Weird. keep asking. I have no idea where that came from. Got it. Got it. So you guys are. I mean, look, you had a nice exit. So you've basically funded this yourself. No outside investors. No outside investors. Okay, I love that. So then you're bootstrap. I mean. Well, <laughs> in, in in the grand scheme of things, I yeah. guess yes, you could call it that. Um, I think I think we've acted as the venture capital investor in this deal, as uh, as we think this is just probably the biggest opportunity we've ever come across. I mean, are you comfortable sharing how much you put on the line here? I mean, how much does this mean to you? Hey, look, uh, I I think uh, like all investors, you put everything out there. You know, Elon, who's an old friend, um, you know, will tell you you put everything you have into these things: your heart, your soul, and your wallet. And uh, and we are proud to be doing that because we believe in this mission. So no safety net. Let's assume you made a hundred million bucks on there on the deal when you sold Linkshare. You put all a hundred million bucks into Collective. Well, let's hope. Uh, one, one. I hope we made more than that, which we did. Um, and thankfully, uh, we. It's not a question of putting all of it in. I think the question of is how big is the opportunity, how fast is it growing, and can we make this a multi-billion-dollar business, if not trillion-dollar business? And we believe we can. All right, very cool. Um, any plans to raise outside funding, or no? You'll keep keep doing what you've been doing. Look, I think uh, the business is. Uh, you know, I have a great um, uh, uh, one of our, uh, our our old investors and now board members, a guy named Julian Brock, who's the co founder of Comcast, told us, you know, focus on building a great business. You you can determine whatever it takes to get there as you go, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly what we're doing. If someone said, "Hey, here's a huge amount of money." I don't know if it would make a difference, but if they said, hey, here's some money and some some other way to grow the business faster, we'd always consider it. But I don't think we're, we're necessarily looking for money other than to keep building and building and building as fast as we can. Yep. I guess last set of questions here before we wrap up. You get going in 2008. Do you remember how you got your first paying customer? Tell that story. Yeah. Look, it's funny. It, in data networks like ours, you're actually not trying to get paying customers in the beginning. You're trying to figure out how to get data. And the challenge with neural nets in particular is they tend to be really bad until you get data scale. And so the first ways we went out and signed our customers up were people were trying to solve the hardest problem in sales that's out there, which is forecasting. And we went to one of the largest publicly traded companies in the world and said, let us be your first partner. Let us be your data science arm outsourced sign up for this new model that allows for sharing of data, but in a confidential way. And the thing about neural nets is they're black boxes. People used to beat up on that a few years ago. Oh, it won't explain to you why it's working, even though it's really good. Today, that black box is actually the reason why people realize if I contribute my most proprietary data, it won't matter. It's totally safe. It's a black box because it can never tell me about what's going on. These guys realized that early on and said, if you're willing to bring that technology to bear, you're willing to fund that, will sign up. And that is to this what day, year was first that? customer still exit. Got to be 20, probably 2011, 2012. Okay. So that's, um, I mean, you, you're customer. still on a big check. I mean, 2008 to 2012, you know, all pre-revenue, all about getting data. You're, you're putting your money out going, okay, I hope this bad boy works. Well, we weren't 140 people at that point. And you have to sure. remember neural net technologies, while they've been around since the sixties, that was when Google brain first proved that it really worked well. And a lot of my buddies were over at Google Brain at the time, and they were the ones saying, you've got to get back into this. You've got to look at this. And so we spent a good four years trying to figure out, how do you make this stuff work? How do you make it work at scale? Because remember, most people weren't really able to get this stuff working very well. They were going to areas like transformers, like NLP, where they thought, okay, maybe we can get this stuff to work. It really took a lot of R&D, and we spent a lot of time figuring out how these business models worked. I think it's why it worked so well for us. And why we're still the only one in our marketplace who's able to use these technologies as successfully as we've been. It's also why our business model is the only one like it. 
So and 2012, really first well customer, it. it was this publicly traded company. How many customers right now are serving today? I, I mentioned we only give out the 5% of uh, B2B GDP that we track. And we do that intentionally because our customers are contributing their data and they want to know that they're not helping this person or that person's not helping this person. So we give them a sense of scale, just like ways to say, hey, look, there's more drivers on the road than any other solution out Steven, there. Steven, you I, the I understand results. you can only share so much data. Can you share when you guys passed a million bucks in terms of revenue, what year that was? I assume it was many, uh, many years ago. Yeah, that was many years ago. I mean, that had to be eight years ago, nine years ago. I'm trying to remember. Okay, so that would have been six, uh, 2014, something like that? Yeah, it was a while ago. Okay. And then if I take, I mean, look, we can look at, you know, if you're not necessarily a B2B SaaS company, right? But if we take 101 customers times average sort of revenue per employee of 120 grand at most B2B SaaS companies, that puts you somewhere around sort of a $12 million run rate. How much time do you think you need to get up above 100 million? Uh, uh, so again, we're not disclosing revenue numbers out here, but what I can tell you is that number would be wrong. Um, and remember, that's because you're thinking about it as a SaaS business. We are not a SaaS business. We're a data network business. We scale well, in a well, vastly Stephen, all different I'm, way. All I'm doing is I'm looking at your headcount, right? So unless yeah. you're burning millions of dollars per month and you're continuing to fund it, which you could be, by the way, right? Um, you're, that's probably your revenue per employee is going to be around 120 to 180. Um, you're saying it's not. It could be higher. It could be lower. Not. You're not wanting to share. It's the same thing, by the way, Linkshare. If you look at Linkshare, the revenues, if you try to look at it as a SaaS model, that's not how we we grew exponentially. We didn't grow linearly. Well, I'm and not SaaS talking businesses SaaS are linear. I'm not talking yeah, SaaS. Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just talking revenue yeah. per employee in general. It's a different metric the way you'd look at it. It's like saying a uh, look at a revenue like uh, Facebook or TikTok on a revenue per per. Uh, for individual, that wouldn't work the same model. Well, I'm not, no, I'm not talking about individual. I'm, I'm not talking about individuals and in the, in the network. I'm talking about revenue per employee. At no, Facebook, no, it's employee. Two million. Yeah. 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 So you're saying your revenue per employee is more analogous to a Facebook, right? Which is in, you know, millions per employee it's, it's versus more, it, a traditional B2B SaaS. I think that'd probably be a better way to think about it. Yeah. 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 That's fair. That's fair. All right. Very cool. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, favorite business book. Of all time, Crossing the Chasm. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? I think it's always Reed Hastings. Uh, number two, uh, three, what's your favorite online tool for building collective? Recently, ChatGPT. Um, number four, favorite, or sorry, how many hours of sleep are you getting every night? I always get eight, no matter what. That is good. Situation, married, single kids? Single. Uh, no, any kids? No kids. No kiddos. And how old are you? Um, uh, 52. 52. Last question. Something you wish you knew when you were 20. I'll give you the piece of advice that I wish I knew when I was younger that uh, one of my board members gave me, which is you have a choice in life. You can work really hard when you're young or work really hard when you're old, but you're going to be one of the two. So I <laughs> pick young if you're smart. Guys, work hard when you're young. He built his first company over nine years, sold it for 425 million bucks. It's called Linkshare. Very nice, obviously, business model there. And two years later, went into a new business called CollectiveEye.com. Uh, think of it, you know, he's building neural nets, really trying to help CROs at companies understand what their actual pipeline looks like based off a contributor model. There's a free tool they use to get this data. They've got 101 folks on the team today. They've quote unquote bootstrapped it, but put in a lot of their own money to fund it up to date as they look to continue to scale. Scale, got their first paying customer in 2012, broke a million dollar run rate in 2014, scaling from there. Stephen, thanks for taking us to the top. Thank you for having me here. Really great opportunity to speak with you and I love your show. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live and the founder shares backend dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS 
founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right. I'll be in the comments. See ya.